Hello and good morning to all. I hope I am audible to all. So we will start this session within five ten minutes as past these participants are joining in. So let all join in so we can start with the session. Thanks for your patience. Thank you.
I request all the participants to please be on mute so we can have smooth session throughout. Thank you. so let's start with this session good morning to all we welcome you in the session the prep session on az204 thanks for joining as this is the weekend's batch myself chaitali your host for today's prep session on az204 certification so let's start with the introduction about the session before going ahead with the session intro let me give you a small introduction about today's event sponsor synergetics synergetics is india's one of a kind corporate learning solution company which help any industry to get their relevant technological solution and helps to be on the top of the competition we are not only restricted to the group trainings but also our microsoft certification training helps every individual fit in this competitive world here are some of the master solution offered by synergetics onboarding solution rescaling solution certification certification plus add on cloud adoption architecting practice uh, party practice playbook latest technology training and emerging technology training Today's session is organized by ATC community and sponsored by Synergetics and Microsoft. Our ATC community is open to all the people who are interested in Microsoft Cloud technologies. You just need to follow our meetup groups, which are Emerging Technology Community for All, Community Nagpur for Nagpur Kurs, Azure Tech Community Gujarat for Gujarati Tech. Azure Tech Community Pune for Pune Curse and AI on Microsoft Platform Community for AI groups. You just need to install the Meetup app on your phone and follow our communities so you will get updates regarding our upcoming event, meetups, webinars, and workshops. Small code of conduct which you all need to follow. Please note that you cannot take screenshot of the presentation and can't do screen recording. 
if you need the recording then you just have to subscribe to our youtube channel we will be posting uh, this recording on a youtube channel also we will drop the youtube channel link in the chat box so you can go through that here you can see the session flow for the today's session we will uh, move ahead accordingly so the break time first break timing will be at 11:30 then the moc activation will take at 11:45 then the main lunch break it will be at 1:30 to 2:30 that is for 1 hour then the q a and will uh, session wind up will be by 4 Now today's speaker for the session is Mr. Nabjoti Barua. Nabjoti sir is has 15 plus years of experience in software development, consulting, and architecting. He is a Microsoft certified trainer and currently working with Synergetics as an ABP technology. Agenda for this session: In this session, participants will get to know importance of this certification, modules covered in this exam, and more. Special announcement to do: We are providing free MOC for AZ two not four on your registered mail IDs. For your understanding, MOC is an important study material for exam preparation. So, if you want to claim free AZ two not four MOC, Microsoft Official Courseware, do fill out the MOC activation form. The link will be provided in the chat box. I repeat, do fill out the MOC activation form to claim the free MOC for AZ two not four. Link for this form will be provided in the chat box. Also, we are providing exam voucher for AZ two not four at discounted rate, that is for three thousand one hundred, as its actual price is four thousand. Participants can drop us mail on info at synergetics-india.com. Now we can grow professionally by adding the latest technology skill with Microsoft various certification. You can enroll for any of this training program with Synergetics, where you will experience live interactive session with the best industry MCTs. Trust us, and we will deliver the best. Go ahead with this slide. Here you can see the building skill of for the Azure certification. Go ahead. The fundamentals courses which we provide. Advanced courses as you as you can see on the screen. Go ahead. Then our upcoming certification session is on. DP two not three. That is on tenth of September. It is full day session, so you can register. The link will be provided to you in the chat box, so you can register through that. Go ahead. Follow us on our social media platforms, uh, so you will get update regarding the sessions, webinars, and workshop. Now I would like to hand over the mic to Nabjoti sir, so he can go ahead with the session. Thanks. Thanks to all. Yeah, thank you, Satyali. So, so good morning to everyone. Hope you can see my PPT and hope you can hear me. You can acknowledge by going into Team Chat to begin with. <laughs> Okay. All right. All good. So let me set the context uh, for this today's training. It's it's all about getting inside to the AZ two zero four. Talking about the number of modules that. AZ two zero four is going to cover. And how the question is being asked in exam, like. So 
So we'll give you insight uh, and also at the same time. Sorry to interrupt. By any chance, can we get a recording of the session? No. You will be given no? the, the URL of this recording from the YouTube. So you can go to the YouTube and you can access uh, the recording of this session. Okay, fine. So URL would be shared with you at the end, end of this session. So you can get access to that URL. Oh, fine. Okay, so I would request all of you to mute yourself until you want to ask question for the smooth execution of this training. Yeah, I was uh, setting the context for this today's training. As I said, uh, what we are going to cover since it is just a couple of hours training. But AZ204 is going to cover lot of services, but it is not possible to go after all the services, but we'll give you an insight. You know what are the services that you need to. Look at. And what context those service is being used. In your workload that you want to take it from on premise to cloud tomorrow. So setting the context of your existing applications or if you want to develop a new applications on the cloud. So what are the service is going to be incorporated? What are the service is going to be used for your workload in order to run your workload? On the cloud. So it is not just a one service, as I said, there are a set of services that we will be discussing from Microsoft Cloud Platform. But as I said, we will not go into in depth. It is all about giving insight. What are the things that you need to explore in context of preparing the exam? And as uh, the previous speaker was talking about the MOC, and you are going to get that MOC Microsoft official course. And that's basically a PP, uh, PDF. So all the module that I'll be talking about today is being. Explained end to end in that. PDF document. So. You can go back to those uh, module from that PDF document and you can. Learn from that PDF, so it is explained beautifully. So everything that module covered for this course AZ204. All right. So my name is Navjoti Borwa. Uh, already I'm being introduced. I work as an AVP technology at Synergetic. So let's get started by setting <coughs> context for the participant. So what this AZ204 is all about? AZ204 is basically for those people, those participants who want to play a role of cloud developer. So when I say developer, they can be a .NET developer, they can be a Java developer, they can be a Node.js developer, or they can be a Python developer. This course is for all of you. This exam is for all of you. So essentially, this course is going to talk about if I have an application developing in on-premises using a particular tool and technology, how we want to take that application and make them up and running on the Microsoft Cloud Platform. So that is what you actually learn. That is what your role would be in a day-to-day -day task that you would be doing to ensure that your workload is up and running on the cloud. So this course will give you less important into the database point of views like DBA database administrator. But yes, I mean like 
this course is also going to include when you take your application to the cloud, of course, that application is going to use database some point in time. Now, what kind of database the application can be used and what are the database available on the Microsoft Cloud? You will get insight to that also at the same time. Now, when you talk about a workload, it is not only an application and database. Because the fundamental of cloud platform is basically. The cloud is offering a lot of native functionality which is not available on premises. And those native functionality is being exposed uh, through different services. So while I'm saying that getting workload on the cloud. So maybe. We are going to go and take the advantage of those native capabilities. By modernizing our existing applications back on the cloud. So bottom line, as a developer, cloud developer role, it is not again taking your application and making them up and running on the cloud, but at the same time you will learn what are the modern services that you can use, incorporate to your existing application to enhance the performance, overall performance, the flexibilities and so on and so forth. So it basically is saying that you would be using. You would be optimizing your applications by taking advantage of cloud native services, cloud native features and functionalities. So you will be completely aware of those features and functionalities as a cloud developer. Within your organization. The second thing, it is all about the prerequisite. The prerequisite, as I said, if you are a developer, you are good to go with this course. It does not matter what kind of application that you develop, but you should be able to understand all the services that we'll be talking about during this course as a developer. But this course, when you go to an MOC, there would be a lot of reference demos and maybe the lab that you would be doing on your own. So all the lab, all the demo is based on the .NET. But as I mentioned before, it's not for a .NET developer only, but the course cannot be parallelly work with multiple programming languages. You know, you cannot write the same applications with Python, .NET, Java, Node.js, and so on and so forth. So that is not possible for the content developer at Microsoft. But at this moment, what the content developer at Microsoft is doing, they are just going and working with ready-made. They're providing the ready-made .NET application that we can take those applications to the cloud and configure them using the cloud functionalities and make them up and running. So. When you practically do things like, you know, as I say, lab or a demo, so you'll be using a .NET code only apart from the Python's or, you know, uh, Java or maybe. Node.js. So that is the prerequisite, so you should be. Actually aware of the programming. The language. Because more or less the programming language like C sharp would be same with uh, Java, but yes, in case of Python's or Node.js, it would be di different slightly. The syntax is going to be different. The API is going to be different and SDK is going to be different. But the overall concept in context of cloud remains same. For the Python developer or .NET developer or a Java developer. Now another prerequisite of this course, it says like, uh, you know, it is not a fundamental course, like it is not going to talk about why cloud. Why we need to get on my 
why we have to go and take my applications to the cloud? What kind of benefit the cloud is going to offer, which is not available in on premises? Why people are attracted to the cloud? So, so these are the fundamentals, you know, what kind of workload that we can take it to the cloud? The possibilities, you know, this is not going to be discussed during this course. So it assumed that the people who are attending this course have a cloud fundamentals. No, they have come across with the fundamental of cloud. That is the another prerequisite apart from the programming language that we are talking about. The third one they say. When you go and manage our cloud service on the. When you manage the cloud services for any kind of workload that you want to deploy. You may be using different tools. So most of the time we are going to use the tools, the web application. As a tool, so it become easy to understand. All the steps need to be followed to deploy something, to configure something, to update something. But the beyond that also, beyond the web application. So we are going to use some tools during this course like PowerShell or CLI. So these are the command line tools where we have to write command in order to manage the cloud services. So it says you may be familiar with the PowerShell or the CLI in the past. It become easy for you to get onto this course because it's not like uh, you know 10% of maybe some 10% 10, 10 of implementation during the course course would be done through a PowerShell and the CLI. But 90% of all the implementation that you would be doing mm -hmm. from the web application itself without going into the command line what we are discussing at this moment so that is what the prerequisite three prerequisite i'm talking about number one you should be familiar with the programming language like c sharp but it is not kind of mandatory it it can be any developer who knows how to write program the second thing is that It is not going to go and talk about fundamental of Microsoft Azure. Like as I say, what is scalability, what is high availability, what is business continuity and disaster recoveries, whether, uh, you know, what is pay as you go, what is subscriptions and so on and so forth. So this is not part of this. Uh, course so assume that you are aware of that as your fundamental and the third one as i said so you need to be familiar with some few i mean two primarily the two tool partial and azure cli because the few of the implementation in this course would be done from the command line using cli and the partial so let's straight get into this course outline. So what exactly you would be learning or how you are going to prepare for this course in order to pass this exam. So we have to learn these modules. Every module talks about a set of services. So you can see the module one talks about app service on Microsoft Azure functions stories cosmos db infrastructure as a service primarily it would be a virtual machines authentication and authorization secure cloud solutions how you are going to secure your solutions beyond the authentication and authorization so authentication and authorizations talks about only 
the credentials, the login that you have to always provide to get access to a resources, get access to a service or an application. But after getting inside the applications, what permissions do I have? That would be defined by the authorization. Now, beyond the authorization and authentication, there may be other implementation to protect your application, protect your data, <laughs> protect your confidential information, and so on and so forth. And that is going to be discussed in Implement Secure Cloud Solution. Then getting into a set of services like API management, event-based solutions, message-based solutions, and uh, monitoring and finally it is cdn content delivery network or maybe other services to do the caching for your applications while it is being deployed on the cloud so these are the robust module as i said uh, we will just take you through couple of module to understand how you should be preparing for your exam that would be implemented to all the modules so it is difficult to cover all the modules in in given time but you'll get to know like you know how to start learning how to start thinking their respective implementation using those services that you are going to explore during the respective module. So that's the kickstart that I'll I, I, I'll I'll go and give it to you. So the pattern would be remain same for all the modules. But in context of the certifications, like suppose yes, you are ready to take this exam AZ204. Now, how you are going to create strategy to study what you have learned during the course from the MOC that I was referring to in the beginning. So it says the more questions is going to come from the develop as your compute solutions. Less question is going to come from area like monitoring. OK, the third party services or a storage. So you can see that as your security also going to go and ask more questions. So you can anticipate where you have to give more focus. But in my opinion. So all the module that you go through from the MOC will be given the equal weightage. You never know what kind of question would be asked. Maybe the number of questions may be more from a particular study areas, but. All the modules from this course is equally important when you prepare for the exam. So you cannot give more important to a particular module and less important to a particular module. In my opinion, so you have to give an equal weightage to all the modules that you will be exploring during this course right from the MOCs or doing lab subsequently for those modules. But when you talk about taking exam AZ204, it says that first you need to complete AZ900, then you go into this AZ204. So AZ204 is titled like as your developer associates. You are responsible for designing for Azure developer who design, build, test, and maintain cloud solutions like application and services. So here we are talking about AZ204. Uh, So 
So this is your AZ 900. It talks about fundamental of Azure. Then you move into the cloud solutions developer, AZ 204. And finally, you become an architect by doing today the news exam would be AZ 305. So this is a path, but here it says it is optional. So it means if you do not do 900, you directly come and do AZ204, it's perfectly fine. So it is optional. So it is not mandatory like that. Okay, you can only take exams once you have, once you produce the certificate from the AZ900, nothing like that. So you can start working AZ204, if you think that is relevant to you right away, you can go and do it. You can just keep learning those module content and preparing for this exam. Now, when you take the exam AZ204, it is not about only AZ204, any Microsoft exam that you would be taking, which is aligned with the certifications. The question is basically based on use cases, based on the problem statements, or based on the case studies. Because today, in any organization in on-premise may be facing a lot of challenges. How to overcome those challenges by migrating application to the cloud, migrating database to the cloud? That is one aspect. That would be a one aspect of the problem statement. The another aspect of the problem statement could be you do not have any challenges, but you want to take your application to the cloud to use or cloud to take the advantage of the cloud benefits. That you can make your application more robust. You can make your application more performance based application. You can make your application highly available. And so on and so. So in context of optimizing the application, in context of modernizing the application of yours by using the cloud service is extremely important. So then in that case, you need to know what service can provide what because that's how you'll be incorporating them into your application to get the benefit of those services. So there would be a use cases and problem statement. There would be a requirement and you should identify what would be the appropriate answer, what would be the appropriate solutions for that requirement in context of eliminating the challenges that you face the another in context of using the cloud native services to make your application robust to enhance the performance of your applications to make your application highly available and so on and so forth because this is something cloud optimized or cloud modernized application that i'm referring to So this is the two contexts that you need to focus. Mainly. To address those use cases and problem statement before you attempt your answer. As you know that Microsoft exam will have all the objective types. There would be a four answer, so you have to pick the right one or sometimes it could be a true and false. You just need to pick out of this two. So 
with that, we are going to start exploring the few modules from this course. Then, as I said, the objective of this training is to give you insight that how you should learn those services that is being incorporated in the respective module. Now, every module will have an agenda. We need to just stick to the agenda and we need to explore every point from that particular agenda. And that is a pattern that is going to be implemented or that is going to be revisit in every module. Suppose this is a module where we need to talk about app service web app. Now, now the first thing that we need to understand what we are going to explore under this module. So this is the agenda for this module. <clears throat> so this is the list of agenda that we need to focus. As I said, the pattern remains same for all the modules, so we need to just go and explore those bulleted points in order to learn the service from this particular module. So when you talk about exploring the Azure app service, the first one, what we are saying in this. Now let us go back to the traditional development. Suppose you are a developer. And you develop application. This is your app. And uh, you can make use of any programming language. Or maybe, as I said, or maybe right. So now. This is your web application. It can be API. It can be a business logic. So it is basically, you know, you start developing whether it is in web application or API or a business logic or maybe Maybe you can say, OK, I have a mobile app, native mobile app running on my mobile, but the back end of the mobile. I want to host on the cloud, so it could be back end. Mobile back end. And so on and so forth. So using any technology and tools, you may be developing all kind of components. Now you think of getting them to the cloud. You want to take 
your application, your API, your business logic, your mobile backend to the cloud. The first thing we must understand, where do I host my web application or API on the cloud? So we need a cloud service to typically go and host my application, my API, my business logic. And that's how the Microsoft Azure has come up with a service called App Service. So it means I need to go and explore the App Service in order to get my application and make them up and running on the cloud on top of App Service. Once I took my application to an app service, so what app service is going to offer? What kind of features and functionality that app service is going to give to my application while my application would be running on top of an app service? That is equally important for us because I'm not just taking applications to the cloud because I wanted to take it. Nothing like that because I am looking for the advantage that I'm going to get by having application on top of an app service. And that is where you have to start talking about features and functionality of an app service. That is going to be incorporate. That is going to be used by. Your underlying application that you deployed, you host on top of an app service. So two things primarily we would be discussing during this module. One, take an application from your on-premise to the cloud app service and then start exploring what my app service can offer, what my app service can provide to the application that I can make my applications really different how it was in on premises. That is the only two point that we need to discuss. We can build conversation on that two points. So when you talk about. Functionality and the features of an app service, it goes like this. The few of them is speaking up. It is not all of them is talking about here, but few important functionalities, the few important offering is being discussed during this module. You will learn more from the MOC. As I said, there would be an end to end. Explanation, everything that is being given. In that. Uh, MOC, so I'll be always referring to an MOC once you have. Read him once you have made this MOC available for your access. The first point the app service says they have got a built in auto skill support because that is what Microsoft Cloud is talking about extensively, the scalabilities and which is really difficult in on premises. When you talk about scaling your application. Getting more resource for your application. Whether it is a horizontal scaling or a vertical scaling. You want to get more machines to run your application. Or. Or you want to increase the size of your machines by adding more resources in order to run your application because application need more resources. So that's how we call it a scale up and down and scale out and in. So the question is that doing this scaling on the cloud is completely automated, automated in the sense like when we want to scale out I can do that. When I. Want to scale in. I can do that also because it's all about the conditions need to be followed. 
at the end of the day, in what conditions I want to do a scale out? What conditions I want to do in scale out? Scale in or scale up and down? So that is something out of the box that you are going to get from the app service. We don't do anything. In fact, we don't manage infrastructure in the app service. We know that Microsoft Azure offers mainly the two type of service model. Platform as a service, PAS and infrastructure as a service, IAAS. OK. So the app service is going to come under the platform as a service. So when I say platform as a service, meaning. I don't build our own infrastructure to run our application. The infrastructure would be provisioned implicitly out of the box. And I just need to get my code and make them up and running on their infrastructure, including all the prerequisite and the dependency would be pre-configured, pre-installed for my application. So that is the platform as a service that we are always talking about. So app service is coming under the platform as a service. So I don't need to go and manage infrastructure. I can ask anything I will get out of the box instantly. Like I need more instances to run my application in context of scalability, I do get. I want to increase the size of the existing instance to run my applications, I do get. All right, so that is one. In context of the app service that we can. Scale our app service. Based on our need whenever we need we scale out or scale up whenever don't need we can scale down and scale in because we know one thing on the cloud. We always work in this pattern called pay as you go. If you acquire more resources from the cloud, you need to pay more. So you need to keep always. That in mind that you are not supposed to have some resources if you're not using them unnecessarily. You're not going to keep those resource up and running because you are just paying doing nothing. So responsibility of the scaling is also being. Important because you know it is not about just doing and scaling because we need to look into how we are going to pay for those services if I'm not going to go and use it from my application unnecessarily. So we need to. Always. Keep the resources that I'm going to use. Whether you do the auto scaling or a manual scaling, but we need to keep that context alive every time. So apart from this scaling capability, what we are discussing from the app service, there are a couple of moves like it says it support continuous integrations and deployment support the CI CD. So it means if I want to get a code. To my app service. From my code repository like GitHub or maybe Bitbucket or maybe, you know, the other code repository, I should be able to configure against my app service in order to complete the process of continuous integration and continuous deployment, the CI CD, what we are talking about. So code is going to be compile compile and build and deploy. Code is going to be pulled from the code repositories every time the code changes in the repository automatically. So benefit of DevOps when you talk about 
the benefits of the DevOps is being integrated with an app service. But this course does not talk about DevOps explicitly. It is just a reference point. If you are interested to do the DevOps course, then you have to go to an AZ 400. That is being targeted to the DevOps professionals. But this is only for development point of views. This is only for learning Microsoft as your service that can be incorporated in your application. So primary focus of this applications and the respective dependent services from this course. The DevOps is not important. DevOps is not giving important during this course. But we are just making a reference point saying that yes, DevOps capability can be out of box out of the box from the app service. Another features and functionalities of the app service talking about the deployment slot. So what exactly the deployment slot? Okay, so what is basically a deployment slot? Now to just to quick understanding. See, cloud is a new environment for all the developer who will be taking their application to the cloud. It's a new environment, so they have no idea how your application is going to respond. Whether your application is going to work on the expected parameters or not. So basically what we are saying before we take our application to the production environment, so we need to keep that application in the staging environment. So that I can possibly go and do the functional testing before I take to the take them to the productions to the end users. So Microsoft Azure allow us to create <laughs> multiple slot. So Microsoft Azure allow us to create the multiple slot. So the slot is basically a kind of a container on top of an app service where we can go and put our application code and start testing all the functionality of our application before we can take it to the production before we you know allow the end user end customer to browse our application so that is what deployment slot functionality is going to come along with the app service the next point they are talking about Host your web app natively on the Linux for supported application state. Like the developer may be using Linux operating system to develop their applications, and they may be using Linux operating system to host their application on premises. And those people would be looking for a same environment on the cloud. So we are talking about underlying operating system 
for the application that is going to run on top. So Windows be default, but yes, the, we can also get the Linux environment to run our code, run our application APIs and so on and so forth. So it is more flexible. The app service allow us to run code on the Windows operating system as well as the Linux operating system. Not only that, app service also support. App service also support. A container based executions like we call them as a containerized application rather than running application directly on top of an operating system. I can run applications within the container. This is basically the concept coming from the Docker container. So you will be learning more on the container base applications, how it is different from the traditional applications. Usually we run on top of the operating system directly. So at this moment, we are just exploring the features of app service. We just mentioned that the containerized application also can be run on top of app service. So app service is out of the box is going to give us that support to run containerized application. We should be able to create container. On top of an app service. So. Having said that, because this is the first service that we are talking about app service, now we need to go and practically see this app service. What we have been talking about, the scaling. Implementing the DevOps continuous integration and deployment, working with deployment slot. And then working with different operating system to run our code inside an app service. So we'll go and explore that practically, then you will get inside what I'm talking about. So I'll go to my go to my dev environment. So this Give me a minute. Now, what we are planning to do in order to use an app service from Microsoft Azure. So that is something that we would be discussing. So we'll be draw a sketch, we draw a kind of internal understanding, and then we can go and implement this. So we have this as your a platform, so it's a cloud as your platform. And in the Azure platform, 
first thing we need to go and create a resource group. And that is why the fundamental is required because we can only deploy cloud service inside the resource group. The resource group is a logical container on the cloud to keep related resources, related services for the workload together within the resource group. We can create multiple resource group under R as your subscription. So we must get a subscription from an account in order to work on Azure. So we are planning to go and identify one service that we are talking about called app service. But when I think of getting something from the cloud, I can always identify the budget of mine that how am I going to spending? How am I going to spend? How am I, what would be the cost of my applications taking into the cloud? That is also equally important. So I said, OK, I'm going to use an app service, but I need to know how am I going to pay for my app service? So first thing what you need to do, you need to buy an app service plan. We call as. Like your telephone. Connections like what plan that you would like to go for. So every plan may have a different. Features and functionalities. So there are a few app service plan right from the free. You can get something free also or maybe basic. Or maybe standard. Or maybe premium. So first thing first, so I need to get an app service plan, selecting one of the plan that we can list out there. So this app service plan is going to give me the compute resource like CPU, memory and the storage. That I can use from my application. And now inside the app service plan, so I can get all these things that we talked about. It could be web applications, it could be API, it could be business logic and so on and so forth. Right, so it could be API. Right? So it could be business logic. And it could be mobile backend. So essentially we said, OK, we have the code. And we want to run inside this app service plan. These are the code. The artifacts code or whatever it may be. So it says when the code will come from on premise. That is your on premise. So here is the code means your application is here. So hypothetically I said I have a dot net application. And I want to take it to the. And it says app service support. CICD. Continuous integrations and continuous deployments with the help of 
different code repository. As I said, it could be GitHub or it could be Bitbucket or it could be DevOps, Azure DevOps pipelines and so on and so forth. It could be FTP or it could be some other code repositories that we can configure with the app service to do these automations. Or we can also do the manual deployment anytime from now. All right. The another point they are saying that we can actually make this plan. Suppose I started with the plan call free. I started with the plan call free, but the free does not give what I am looking for. Then I have to go and upgrade from free to standard. And that is something what we call as a scale up. The scaling that we talked about. Right, so that would be kind of scale up. Or maybe after sometimes you feel that no, the standard is 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 going to give me a lot of things, but I don't need all of them. I'm OK with the basic, so you can come back to the basic also. Anytime, so then it would be called as. The scale down. But how far you can go and do the scale up? Suppose you are asking for a 1,000 CPU in that ESP app service plan. That is not possible. You can move from 1 CPU to 2 CPU, 2 CPU to 4 CPU, 4 CPU to 8 CPU. But there are limit of scaling up. Then you can make the other kind of scaling. You can say, I want to multiply. Okay. So I want to multiply this service plan with two more. Means I am going to get two more. service plan the when we get two more service plan your app is also going to come here and your app is also going to come here so you have a three copy of your app running in three different instances and this is something what we call as a skill out Or subsequently, if I take it back, that would be scale in. So if I'm paying for one instance is one dollar. Now we have to pay for the three dollar because I have got three instance. But the question is that how the user would be redirect to my application, which is running in three instance. Maybe the load balancer is going to come automatically since we are talking about it's a pass platform as a service. All the underlying requirement would be provisioned out of the box to utilize the resources that I have provisioned for my application any given point in time. So there would be a load balancer and this three instance would be sitting behind the load balancer. 
And as I said, that is going to be done automatically, and that is the power of the cloud, what we are talking about. You should be able to anticipate and acknowledge and appreciate what cloud is offering for your application. It's not just getting your application and making them up and running. So what you are looking at, you're looking at different features and functionalities. The app service itself is offering to me. And I'm just subscribing those functionalities if I need them to be used from my application, from my APIs. The another last point of features and functionalities that talks about that this box that I have created the service plan so I can make use of. For kind of. Windows. Or maybe Linux. So this is flexible, so. All the Windows developer can get a Windows based ASP. All the Linux developer will get the Linux based ASP. Now, apart from this. Three things or four stuff that we talk about the scaling or maybe, you know. DevOps integrations or maybe talking about the operating system and we talk one more things we can run container also on on top of this app service so basically what we call them as a docker container All right, so there was a question. I did not see that. OK, is that app service plan synonymous with the virtual machines? Yes, it is virtual machines only in cloud context. But this virtual machines are called as a stateless virtual machines, unlike. The virtual machines that we create on our own. Because here we do not select the which version of the operating system that I want while I'm creating this particular app service plan, but you can always. Conceptualize this app service plan as a virtual machines because that is going to give us something called. Compute resources like CPU or maybe memories and the disk. So this is exactly how virtual machines give us. So these are virtual machines at the end of the day, but we cannot configure those virtual machines. We cannot install things on top of the virtual machines. We cannot ask what type of virtual machines that we want with some limited stuff only can be selected or can be given. OK, so that was your question. I guess that is. All right. Yeah, so I was in the middle of this discussion that I say that yes. Uh, these are the features that we talked about, you know, the containerize and 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 scalabilities and other functionalities. And we talk about the slot also, the deployment slot. So we say that, you know, I want to create the multiple slot, the deployment slot saying that this app, before it goes into the production, so I can keep these applications in the staging.
All right, so so there is some kind of. Uh, yeah, so I can just go and talk about the deployment slot also. Right, so it's basically talking about OK, my app is going to be go and stored in the two, the, the first in a staging. So we can put something like as a staging or maybe a productions within the app service plan itself. So your app can be put into the staging production would be an empty. This is the production and this is the staging. So once the testing and. Other observation is completed on the staging, so I can take this code to the productions and that would be made available to our end user and customers. So this is basically called as a swapping of. A code. The swapping between those slots straight into productions and whatever it was there in the production will come back to the staging. Right, so having said that because this is. What? a quick understanding of the app service, what we are discussing in the module one. And we can go back and practically deploy this app service. So how do I do that? As I said, we need Azure subscriptions to work with Azure service, and we can get all the service in this website called portal.azure.com. So it will ask for a login. You have to type your credentials that you have your subscription against. And you should be given that portal. The portal.azure.com. You can see that from where we can get access to all the Azure services. So I'm just creating a dashboard, something like uh, yeah, AZ204 as a dashboard. Okay, so there are multiple ones, so I can. This is fine. Now, if I go to the all service the Microsoft is offering at this moment to just to quickly visit these services. You can see this. These are the different category of services. It's a huge list of services that we can see in every categories that you can map with your workload that you want to take it to the cloud tomorrow. All right. So now which category that we are looking for since we are talking about the web application so that the category has to be web. So if I go to the web, we can see few services related to the. App service that what we are discussing. So our discussion was based on the app service in the module one. So from this category, we can see there is a web. And under the web, you see an app service plan. This is what I was referring to. Right, so app service plan. So we need to go and deploy an app service plan. So I can go to the app service plan under the web category. So it says there is no app service plan so far. But as I said before, the app service plan or anything that you want to deploy in the cloud, first we have to create a resource group. And then we have to create an app service plan. Then only we have to get my 
web app inside the app service plan. The three things that we need to do. So while I'm creating an app service plan by just clicking on the create button. Creating an app service plan, it is going to ask me the resource group. It is mandatory. You cannot skip that. You cannot skip that, so you can create that. So I can give a name of my. So I can say the demo resource group. That could be any name. So I can have a two resource group, one for the state, one for the staging and one for the production or something like this. I can do that. So I'll be giving the name of the app service plan. So here it's also I'm going to give you a demo ASP. And this is what we are talking about the operating system Windows or Linux. So which one I would like to go? I go with the Windows. And the region where I want to deploy this app service plan. And I have the region from India also. You can see the Central India, South India, West India. So these are different regions from the India itself. So I select the East US. And as I said, we need to pay for the app service plan based on what type of plan is being used. So you can see by default it is using the standard S1, but I can change it. I click on the change. I get to see these are the different plans altogether. More plan can be seen below. Every time you select a plan, you will get the features and functionalities here. Include the features. So if I go with S1. We are going with the S1. OK. And then we get what kind of features you said it can be done auto scaling. What we discussed the staging slot up to five slot that we can create support for custom domain and SSL. It is going to be backup daily. All the artifacts of my application is going to backup daily and it is supporting the other load balancer like traffic manager. But if I go to the dev test if i go to free suppose i can just make use of free also i don't get any features like you know it cannot be used in production anymore like d1 it support only the customs you know so this is something that we can go and make and this is exactly the cost also the costs are different based on the features and functionalities so cost of this is approximately 3k per month if I go with the S1 at this moment and tomorrow if I go and do the scale out so it is 3k into 3 9k I have to pay any given point in time. So that depends whether you want to do the scaling or not. So it is S1 only the default one so we go and do it. The tag is just a label we can go and skip it and creating that app service plan. So my app service plan is being. Deployed so I can see it right in front of me. So this is done the box that I have used with all the compute resources that we can see 100 C ACU. As your compute unit, so it is approximately one CPUs given to this particular box with some stories with some ram one point you know five seven gb of ram and so on and so forth whatever it may be but we are going to get some compute resources for this box 
So box is ready. Now we need to get our application and make them up and running. But before we do that, we'll take a break. Then we'll come back and we'll see. How can I get apps? Inside the app service plan. So at this moment, the apps is empty. No apps, nothing here. We just got a box. We just got an app service plan. All right, so if you have any questions till then, otherwise we'll take a 10 minutes break. We'll be coming back in 10 minutes and we'll continue from here itself. So hope you are able to understand what I'm talking about. You should be able to anticipate because although it is a limited time, but I'm just trying to make you understand how you should learn things because you need to questions. You need to go back to the fundamentals and then build the concept and you know from there you need to take it off. So it is just an incremental learning is going to happen. There may be many things that you would be learning about the app service during the actual training that will happen for this AZ204 or maybe from the MOC that is being shared to you. But we should be able to set up the learning boundaries, you know, understand why we are doing it, what for. All right, so that is something we are exploring. So if you have any questions on that, you can ask. Otherwise, we are taking a break. OK, I will get AZ20 certification voucher and I think uh, there are people in the back end who will answer these questions regarding the regarding the uh, certification vouchers and other stuff. OK. So we cannot change the timing for lunch break and the other bit because that was mentioned in the beginning. So we'll stick to the. The time line that is being mentioned in the beginning of. This. Uh, session, so there won't be any changes for that. Uh, OK, so there is a question. So you have used a free Azure subscription for 30 days. Can I upgrade to this? No, you cannot 90 days because there are some some offering. I do not know about that. What offering under which you have created the free account. So if this offering is available, you can try upgrade that. You should be able to give it, but in general, no. Does the free basic standard premium have an extra service with? Within or it is only about scaling resources, no extra because if I go and keep browsing, what is we get in free? What is get what we get in basic and what we get in standard? Apart from the scaling, there are many things like whether you can create a staging slot or not whether you can implement the custom domain or not. You may not do it in free. You may not do it in basic, but you can do it in standard apart from the scaling. OK, scaling is only not the deciding factor of moving from one. To another. OK. All right, so we'll take a break, then we'll come back in 10 minutes.
Okay, so let's get back. Uh, so hope everybody can see my screen and uh, everybody can uh, hear me. OK. So what is the next steps that I was referring to? The next step is all about getting application into the. App service plan. So as of now, there is no app inside the app service plan right on the top. So what we can do, I can go to the all service again. And uh, I can browse through the list of services under the web. So we get one service on the top called app service, what we have been discussing. We created an app service plan. Now we are going with the app service. So we go to the app service. We don't have any app service so far. So we are going and creating an web app. The app service is converted into a web app by default. As you can see there. And uh, we select the existing resource group because I want to put that my resource group is the same because I have to basically identify my service plan as a target where I am going to deploy my web app. And that is the whole logical sequence, uh, sequence that I'm talking about. So I give a name of my web app. So we can say demo web app. It should be unique kind of, I'm just giving a a number to make this name as a unique because it is associated with a domain name. So as your website.net. And as you can see, I can run code inside the web app. I can run Docker container inside and web app. I can run a static website also. Static website is mainly for HTML based application. So only HTML and JavaScript based applications can come under the static web app. Rather than dynamic. Web app, which is basically work with the database and so on and so forth. So we can say code because at this moment we talk about support of container you know, by the app service. Yes, we can see that Docker container is right next to the code. But in a typical deployments, we go with the code. So if I go to the code, then we have to tell the runtime. 
from this list. You can see the list. Okay. So what kind of application that I can run inside this web app that we are talking about uh, Ruby, Python, PHP, Node.js, Java, and the .NET. So I'll go with the .NET Core 3.1 hypothetically. I can go with any, any kind of things because it is only for understanding. I can go with the Linux or a Windows. I go with the Windows because we have already created a service plan somewhere in the East US. So if I go and select the region East US, I'm going to get my demo ASP last time what we have created under the service plan of S1, standard one. So essentially what I'm saying, whatever the service plan that we have created already, I'm going to go and create this web app inside the service plan based on the Windows environment. All is being set up now. Then if we go to the deployment, you see that is what we talked about, like connecting for dev and test, basically your DevOps related things. You can connect to the GitHub to pull the code from the GitHub from here itself. But we are not connecting with the GitHub as a inbuilt features of the web app to get connected to the code repository at this moment. We don't have it. OK, so we can just skip that. We can go to the networking. The networking is also a. Another features of the web application because networking means I want to make this web applications. Private. By putting inside a private network, if I want to do that, I can go and select the network that I want to put my application inside. So I just need to go and figure out the virtual network. So by default, your web application is public. Anybody can access your web application. But but moment you put inside a virtual network, so it cannot be public. It would be only allowed to access based on the firewalls or maybe network security group or maybe access control list and so on and so forth. So this is also another feature. So if I want to make my application only being accessed within the organizations, not for the public user, so I can put into the organization network by selecting these features, by configuring that, that, that the features what we are looking at, making application private within the network. OK, so we'll skip that because we are not making this application as a private putting into the networking. And the monitoring is another aspect like. Most importantly, we have to monitor the performance of an application. Because. So we have to monitor the performance of an application. That is something very, very important for all of us. Like whether my application is performing on the expected parameters or not. That is extremely important to evaluate time to time. So by putting an application on the cloud is. Not the end of the story. Because at the same time we keep going back and looking at our applications, monitoring that applications, whether it is working on the customer expectations or not. 
in context of performance, in context of latencies and so on and so forth. If I want to monitor my applications, I'll be creating an additional service called application inside. So application inside is an independent service on the cloud to monitor your applications, to get the telemetry out of your application and can be presented in a form of graph that you can visualize and you can anticipate about your applications, what is going on under the counter of performance or under counter of latencies or any other the factor that will cause the overall application performance, we can go and figure it out. We can go and see it. So many things is coming out of the box because I don't have to go and you know keep thinking how am I going to monitor my web application? You know. There is a service will do this job. You just need to configure that. And that is again the power of the cloud that I was talking about. And this is what we should be able to acknowledge and appreciate while I'm running applications back on the cloud any any time from now. So how it is allowing you to put things inside a network to make it private, how it is allowing me to you know, put things in 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 place to monitor my application for performance for other counters, other metrics. How the application is getting integrated with the code repositories in context of deployment that is going to happen in this target web application any given point in time. I think what else we need? The most of the things that is required by the application is coming out of the box. I don't do anything. It is re right there. I just need to configure to incorporate them into my application. Unlike on premise, you have to do everything manually there. Everything setting up on, on their own. So tag again, I said it is just a label to just to give a label on the thing so we can go and create this web. So I'm going to create this an empty web app. There is no code as of now. We have to get the code inside the web app. So how do I get the code? As I said, I can get a code. The code that we are talking about, the .NET application code. So from the development, I suppose there is a VS Visual Studio. So suppose I am using Visual Studio to develop this .NET application or after developing in a Visual Studio, I put my code in the GitHub, suppose. All right, so I can make use of directly the Visual Studio to push the code into the web app inside the app service plan or I can go and configure the GitHub. Configure the GitHub. With my web applications to pull the code. All right, so into my a target web application. So we can do it anything out there so I I can go to my web app. I can also pin it in my dashboard to just to get a quick access. So this is my app service plan and this is my web app running inside the app service plan. Now if I go to the app service plan in the app, you are going to see one app. I can have more than one app inside the same app service plan because app service plan is a server. That runs more than one application. Or if you want to make a dedicated server for this application without bringing the other application into this box, it's fine, it's okay. Right? 
So now we are going with the code like, you know, this is the demo web app 008 that is created. So I can go stepped into this. Do I have any code? No, I don't have any code at this moment. But if I try to browse the URL that is given to me to access this web application, there is an URL from the overview of my web app. So if I go there, I get a default page. I get a default page that is coming out of the box from the web applications that we deployed. But I can go and go to the deployment center. There is a deployment center that we can see. Or before that, we have something called deployment slot that I talk about. By default, it is a production which is up and running. I can go and create a new slot. What we discussed because my standard. App service plan allow me to create up to five slot. That is what we learn from the features and functionalities. I can say Stacy. And I go and create the staging slot. I can have different settings while I'm running application in two different slot. So suppose while I'm running an application in staging slot, I can use a different database as a backend while I'm running this application in the production, same applications with a different database that is possible. So slot wise, I can do the configurations. So I'm creating a, a slot which is called running. I can distribute the traffic also. Suppose I want 80% traffic to go into the production, but the 20% go to the staging for some kind of new versions coming into a staging. So in order to test that new version, I at least allow the 20% of the external traffic to come here. That is also traffic distributions we can do across the slots. So we don't see an IP address on this if you this is, but you can go to the properties of your if you go and type the property. So you will be looking at this virtual IP address here by going into the property of this web application. Suppose tomorrow if you want to create a custom domain, you'll be using this virtual IP that was assigned to this particular box, the ASP, uh, the web application. And this web applications can make outbound requests on those IPs by default. OK, so that is all about the IP stuff that you asked. Please mute yourself. If you. All right, so you can go to the property. You can get your IP address there. So I was in a different thing. So so I, I just go to the deployment slot. And now if I go to my. staging slot from here. Now currently I'm staging slot. I get a different URL for the staging slot. I can click on that. This is the staging written in between, but there was a production in the previous one. OK, staging and productions I can see, but in both places I'm getting the default one. Now suppose I go to the staging. Currently I'm in the staging and I go to the deployment center. 
and I want to pull the code from my repository. Suppose I can go to the one of the repositories who support the CI CD. So I go to the GitHub repositories. It's already login because multiple time I have configuring. So I just go and access my repository. And I'm saying that OK, you go and get this. From that particular repository into this. The staging one. So code is available in this repository under this account. This one. So that is the account that I have in GitHub. So I log into the GitHub. I I'm trying to get a code. Into my target. Application that is running in the staging. So I just save it. So by just going in, OK, so use the same one. Available workflows. So we need some. This required some connectivity to be done. This is fine. So it takes some time. I have to come back again and see this workflow options and we should be allowed to save this. So it will go and start saving what we are doing and to connect this one. So preview files that we are seeing it. OK, so in some time, so it takes time to just to reflect. So I just go back and refresh again and do it one more time. To set it up again. With my repository. So I'm just refreshing one more time. So from the master branch. All OK, so if it is all OK, it will go and take against. So we'll, we can come back in sometimes. OK. Uh, we can talk about. Changing this also. That is also basically going to go and make use of this in a log or. Let me do it one more time. So due to some credentials with this browser, it's not able to connect to my. So if it is once it is connected, we should be able to. Get it from the there itself, so we'll just leave it at this moment, so we'll go back to our application. We'll come back there, so suppose I want to see you. Or I want to just get. Or create application then and there, so I go to the tool. So we get a tool called advanced tool. And I say go to this advanced tool. And from the advanced tool, I go to the CMD. And I go to the site, I go to the WW root, and there is a default page. I can add my own page here, new file. So I can say index.html. And I can remove this default one. And I edit this index.html. This is my staging. 
version. Or you can say this is my web app. So I save this with that. So I can now go back to my the staging deployment slot. So this is the staging. If I refresh this, I get my new piece but if i go to the production the production is still there the default one now i go back say okay i have tested everything in staging now i want to swap staging to the production so i just go back to the swap you say the source is staging and target is the production and i just click on swapping this is what i was discussing the swapping between the swapping between the two stuff to to slot that we are talking about now whatever it was there in the staging it will go into the production in some time and whatever it was there in the production it will come back to the staging and i can just go and remove it or maybe i can take a backup of it and i can delete the staging for some time until the new version comes to the staging again, do the same things to replace the old versions with the new versions swapping between the staging and the production every time. No, you cannot swap this container based application so. Yes, so container based as long as this application is remember what. So application configurations also will be swapping the the root configurations. Uh, or as I said before also. Before also I said if you. Make a configuration specific to a particular slot that is also possible. Now it is coming the production, so we can make delete the staging. I don't need it. But as far as the configurations, what you ask, like suppose if you go to my web application and I go to the configuration, I'm currently in my production one. OK, so that is what my. The production one. So I go to the configurations. And I want to add a configuration. Go to the app settings and I go to the add new configuration. So suppose I said connection string. So here I see. This is the connection string, something like. Uh, my. Connection string. So this is the connection string. I'm just saying that's for hypothetically about the. So when you go and say. Yes, I want to make this configurations only to be used by production. So I can say the deployment slot setting. The rest of this con configuration would be swapped, but this is not going to swap because you made it only to available into the production environment. OK, so that will make it. Slot specific configuration, so if you want to after that, if you want to roll back, you can reswap it. Then production will come back to the 
staging and staging will go back to the production. Suppose in some case you face a problem, once you take it to the production, so you can take it back. In fact, you can take it back to some other slot, not to the staging also. We can create another slot called old version. So I can go and take that to the old version. I can take it back, make it production empties. And then from the previous version, I can again swap it to the production. So we can do like, you know, those permutation and combinations as long as the swapping is possible. As long as we can create multiple slot that is being supported by your app service plan. All right, so that is something we can always deal with the configurations on rolling back to the not exactly every version because the slot has a limited option like suppose now we have only five slot can be created including the production right so i cannot suppose i have a 20 version so it is not possible to create 20 slot in my standard one, but if you have a premium, then yes, of course, you can create a 20 slot. So we need to manage within the given limit of a slot that we are talking about. Within a given limit of the slot that we are talking about in this context. OK, so that is something. We have to take care of in context of slot, in context of the slot. So we have to manage within the number of slot that is allowed to create in a given pricing plan, means the, the app service plan. So every app service plan has a different number of slot quota. So we need to go by the quota only. All right, so the last point that we are going to talk about in context of the app service is all about scaling. Okay, you see all about scaling. So how do I do the scaling? I say the scaling can be done in two ways. So it could be scale up and down. Or it could be scale out and scale in. So if I go back to my web application, we can delete my this slot. So I just need to give the name of the slot here that you want to delete. Then we come back. And then we select for the scale. So we get these two options, scale up and scale out. So first I'll go to the scale up. Now currently, I have S1. So what I get in S1, I get 1.75 GB of memory, 100 total ACU. That is Azure Compute Unit equivalent to one CPU, the physical CPU. And you need to pay, that is the cost, approximately 3K INR per month. But against that, what you get, you get these features. You can create up to 10 instance in the scale out. Staging slot, you can go up to five. Daily backup, traffic manager, custom domain, and SSL configuration is allowed under the S1. But let's look at other one. So I go with suppose P1, the premium one. And I go and see this. 
instead of 10, I can go up to 20 instance. The 10 more instance that I got by just moving from S1 to P1. So what we are doing, if I say apply, then it will move from S1 to P1. So what we are doing, we are scaling up. Similarly, I can scale down. Again, come back to the S1. Staging slot, last time it was five. Now you can go up to 20. You can see that. And this is for you pay more. That is what you pay more if you go to a P1. So you're paying approximately 15K, not the 3K that we paid for your S1. All right, that is scale up. Then go to the scale out. Now scale out, as I said, the number of instance that you like to create. So I can do it manually. I can do it manually saying that this is the manual one. I can increase the because I can go up to 10, but I said I want to make it three instance. But making a three instance straight away is not a wise thing because you have to pay three dollar. If I said three K means you have to you have to pay now the nine K. INR for one month for three instance that you have created by manually setting them to three. If I save this. OK, I'm making it three. Then I go back to my property. And I should see instead of one instance, we will be given three instance. OK, status number instance that you will be given out there uh, in, into into my not here into my app service plan because scaling is not done for an application. Scaling is done. So if I go to the properties. You see the number of instance count coming three here. So it means app service plan is being multiplied to more. So total number is now three. Because you made it three saying that any given point in time, I need the three instance of my app service plan. Automatically, what is the content of that app service plan is being replicated into two more instances. They put load balancer in front of them. They put just a load balancer in front of them. And now if I make a request to one of the instance which is sitting behind the load balancer would be responsible for. Entertaining my request. Yes, all three server is having the same replica. So your app. Is now here also. Here also. The same app that I was talking about. Now suppose as a user. If you. Request. It will go into the load balancer. And the load balancer will take me. To the one of the instance. We do not know which instance would be given to the end user while they will be making requests for this application. It doesn't matter as long as we get access to the application. It doesn't matter which instance has. Serve my request. But that would be coordinated by the load balancer automatically by knowing that yes, the instance are OK to entertain your request that has come from the Internet.
All right. Now, as I said, making three instance manually is not a good idea. So I can go to again. Scale out. I said no, it is not a good idea. So we can take it back to one, the default one. So it is going back to the default. We can go to the property and we can check that. Now it is one instance. But that says I want the number of instance. I want to increase the number of instance from one to two to two to three, three to four, four to five, five to six until the maximum number that I set for a particular rules that I want to create. Meaning, I say, I want to do the auto scaling automatically. The scaling has to be done automatically. That's the point that I'm trying to make at this moment. But when this auto scaling has to happen, what is the conditions on what this auto scaling to be operated? I say, I want to set a conditions for the auto scaling based on a matrix. The what is the matrix? Maybe the matrix could be a CPU uses. So if I say if the CPU uses is greater than 70%, I need to add one more instance into the existing numbers. So CPU uses is a matrix so we call as is a matrix. So I want to go and set a conditions on a matrix. So CPU uses is just a one metric. There would be multiple metrics on what you can set a conditions to scale out, increase the number of instances. OK, so I'm saying that CPU uses is just a one. But there may be different type of metrics on what I can set conditions. Yeah, so you can always go and make a minimum numbers. Yes, you can do that what you are asking. So you said anytime I want a four, but if that load comes in, you go by the CPU uses and you can go up to maximum eight. So you always keep in between the range of four and eight. You can do that. So there would be a three things that we can set. One is called minimum number. One is called max number. So here it said minimum has to be four. In regular. And maximum you can go up to eight, but when it will go up to eight, whenever they need it, the peak time. So you can calculate. And you can another things again, you can say default. You can keep the default number also. Sorry. 
this back. So what I'm saying here, the mean number, the four and the max, eight, and uh, you have the default. Number may be something like, yeah, default may be a four. That is what you are saying, always the four. But you have a budget of maximum eight that you can go up to eight, but when it will go up to eight, so based on the condition, and this is exactly what we are talking about here. So minimum we talk about four, maximum we can go up to eight, and default I can make it four. So now we just need to go and add the rules. So here is the rules based on the matrix. So it says the matrix that I'm loading at this moment to see that list of matrix that I can set the condition on. So let the matrix load it into this drop down and I can pick one of the matrix and go ahead and set a conditions. So it's just taking a bit of time to load this. OK, so we can see the CPU percentage right there and it goes below current percentage is just 3% used, but we are setting a conditions if it is greater than 70. And if it is persist for 10 minutes, the pattern has to be persist for some time to take a decision so you can increase the count by one. That is what you. Similarly, you can go and add a, another rules on the same matrix. Saying if it is less than. Maybe 50%. Then we can instead of increase, I want to decrease count by one. So scale out and scale in both is being done in a one single rules. You can have a multiple rules together. So we can go and save it. So when the time comes, when the condition will satisfy, they will keep doing their job in the backgrounds and it will keep doing until we reach, until we encounter the maximum number because that is being driven, that is being basically uh, what you call it. Yeah, that is that is the maximum limit that we can spend. Probably you have $8 to spend per month for this instance in any circumstance that we are talking about. OK, so having said that all these things that we are talking about, so we don't create all of things that these are coming out of the box. So what we are doing, we are just going and configuring them. We are just going and configuring. Everything that we want. On top of my web application that we want to run inside the app service plan. Apart from that, there are many things can be done, like one of the important things called authentication. The previously. We used to write code within an applications to authenticate user. Saying that, OK, you have to type the username and password, then only you will get access to your application. How do you do it by writing a code by using different provider as a .NET developer that we did? 
but those days is gone on the cloud. See, it says you don't have to write any code in an application. So authentications and authorization is out of the box. You just need to configure it in your application. All right, so how do I go and authenticate? It says you can provide the identity providers. The identity provider can be anyone who provide an identity. It could be Facebook, it could be LinkedIn, it could be Microsoft, it could be Azure Active Directories and so on and so forth. So we can get a list of from where I want to get an identity. So you can see it. Right? So I can go and say I want to use a Microsoft identities that is basically Active Directory, which is currently I am in the Active Directory, so I can go make use of it. So it is going to go and register this application under an Active Directory called App Registrations in a single tenant. It said the required authentication to get access to these applications and so on and so forth. You can talk about the permissions, the role that you would be playing. The Microsoft Graph permission. So if you want to make a call to the Microsoft Graph API by having these identities, so you need to set the permission. So now we just need to So if I go to a permission stuff, what kind of permissions that you would like to give it? Request API permissions. OK, so there are different one. Where we can set up the permission, but we didn't. We are not learning anything at this moment about the graph API, so we can leave it. We can just go and add the identity to the. My application, so what what we are saying at this moment. What we are saying at this moment. That anybody wants to go and get access to this application, it will ask for authentications. And I have to get my identity from the Active Directory to get access to the. Yeah, you can do a custom authentication by writing your own code. Still, you can do it. But we are talking about like what is available in the Microsoft. Anything can be customized. Right, so. What we are getting out of the box from my. Microsoft. Cloud, that is what we are discussing. We are not discussing anything to be customs or whatever. So any custom to any way you can do it by just writing your own code. Alright, so that is what we are doing at this moment. So out of the box, we are talking about features and functionalities that can be implemented back in my applications, not only scaling, not only uh, the deployment slot, not only CI CD. So there are many. The functionalities can be incorporated. So that is exam point of view that you have to see that, you know, because you have taken this application to the cloud not to only run your applications, to avail those 
functionalities by enhancing the productivity of the developer because developer used to do it manually in back in your on premises. Now you do by just configuring them. You get it by just configuring them. OK, so with that, this is something. That we need to discuss in context of just one. App service point of views. OK, so app service point of views that we just need to go and. look into this. Now we are going to go and talk about the another. Important service. That is being used on the Microsoft Cloud that is called Stories, which is important in context of. AZ204. So we know that we have been talking about application, application, application. I did not understand what you are referring for an app IDs. <laughs> OK. Hello, so yes. I, I was I was looking at the uh, authentication tab when you were showing the authentication. They okay, seem to be OK, 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 oh, you are talking about in context of authentication. Yes, I got it. OK, that's fine. So now for that, we need to understand the active directory. So that is basically see. The application that need to be authenticated. Using the as your active directory need to be registered on the active directory. We call as a app registration. The moment we register an app on top of an active directory, it will give us an app ID, which is globally unique. So other application that you are going to register will given the, the, the will get a different app ID. So app ID is just an identifier that yes, you have register an application on Active Directory. Now you should be able to make a call to the APIs, which is being protected by Azure Active Directory or service which is protected by Azure Active Directories. So Azure Active Directory is an identity provider. One case, the another, you have to register your app on the Active Directory to avail the service from the Active Directories in context of authentication. That is the app ID in that reference. Okay, oh. and can we like create the uh, uh, app service plan and app service without an app ID. Like I, I thought it was like by default it was created. That's what I thought. Uh, is it but is it created by default or can we skip using a AD uh, app ID? You you just you do not mix the two things. So let me explain this. Okay, then you will be. So we have been talking about. OK, so there is a app. Web application. And it's a global applications. This is giving us an IP and endpoint. And from anybody's. Just go and browse this application. Because this application is a anonymous. This application is made available for the anonymous user. OK. OK. 
that is one thing. Now you are saying that now you want these applications to go and make use of Azure. Active Directory. Now, what is Azure Active Directory? Azure Active Directory is an identity platform. Today we call not as an AAD, we call as an identity platform. Who can provide identity? Identity in our case may be username and password. That's how identity will come into the picture. And we can make use of multi factor also means along with the username and password, they will ask more questions, more information. That's how it is called as a multi-factor. Now what we are trying to do, I said now the anonymous user won't be able to access this app. Only the valid user, which is available under an active directory, can access this app. Then what? I have to register this app. inside the active directory. The moment I register an app, this app inside the active directory, they will give you some informations. As an output of the registration, they would be given an application ID. And this application ID would be used by an application as a client ID to get a token from the Azure Active Directory because this would be a client application in that case. It's not a client ID, but the moment this application wants to call an API, like any other API which is being protected by Active Directory, then this app ID would be treated as a client ID. Then you can go and ask the Azure Active Directory to give me a token and get that token and produce the token in front of the API that you can get access this API from this application. So once is the two things again, since it is not an active directory session, I don't want to go into detail, but in brief what to respond to your questions. OK, to respond to your question, so it says when you register your app, the registration is a prerequisite to protect this application using the active directory. That's it. This is just a one thing. Now we can extend this conversation saying that if application has to go and make a call to some kind of API, then this app ID would be used from the application as a client ID to get a token from your active directories and produce the token in front of the API to call this API. OK, and um, yeah, I understand. If I want to yes. call the API, then uh, we can get a token, but. Uh, I mean, what, first what? thing is like, is is yeah. this uh, is app ID in uh, this concept uh, in, in this AZ204 exam? Is it part of that exam? AZ204? Yeah, there is a module. There is a module in the active authentication and authorization. If you've seen that module number six, mm -hmm. where we talk about authentication okay. and authorization, there will be talking about that application registration and all these things. It is part okay. of this AZ204. Okay, go to the MOC and find it. You will get app registration in detail. Uh, right. Yeah, and you were explaining two different things, right? And uh, does App ID help in the second case also when we want to like restrict the access of our web app 
to particular people or like particular endpoint. Uh, there also we can use app ID concept uh, and like restrict like other. Yeah. App ID would be I used guess. as just a credentials. It's like an alternative mm -hmm. to your. It is basically called as a service principle. So you will get to I, so see like you know so. Uh, you just need to look at this module six, what is called service principle, what can be used in that. But in case the app ID is just a, another alternative credential to access the Microsoft APIs, the graph APIs, like suppose you want to access a calendar of yours, Outlook calendars, to see what are the appointments for the next week. So who is going to give you that detail? The APIs, the graph APIs. Mm -hmm. So in order to make a call to this graph API, so you need that IDs from your application, the client application. So client application would be your web application or console application or mm -hmm. mobile applications. Mm -hmm. Okay, in that context, but authentication and authorization straight going into an applications can be done directly by an active directory. Like suppose you are going into the portal every time. Suppose if you are having, I'm going into the portal management portal from where I have done all this practical. But before I go to the portal, I am being asked, who am I, right? I yeah. type username and password. Now that username and password coming from where? From the Active Directory. Okay. So that is authentication is a different to just to go and get access to that application. But from that application, if I want to call some APIs or maybe the Microsoft API or my own API, which is being protected by an Active Directory under a particular tenants or so, so on and so forth, then we require that ID, the client IDs, in order to get the token from the active directory and produce in front of the API for a custom app in order to get access to this. So another question is like, suppose and, I... And, and the yeah. API can be part of another resource group as well, and we can just use the client... Uh, oh, yes, the yes, 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 okay. yes. So basically it is a way to like uh, without setting up uh, authentication, explicit authentication, we can just uh, uh, use app ID to like uh, access various parts of Azure services. Yes, 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 yeah. yes. OK. OK, there is a question. Suppose I want only a part of my app requiring the authentication would be part of it app, OK? What do you mean by part of the app? OK, so you are saying that you want a home page. To be. Made available to this, yes, you can programmatically that is that you can do it by using MSAL as a developer using the same Microsoft as your. Uh, authentication libraries, so you can do that. But you need to write a piece of code to do that. The rest of this identity provide you don't have to create a database to keep your identities. The identity provider would be Active Directory, but to manage your Active Directory in a granular portion of your applications, you have to write a code. You can do that. The answer is yes, you can do that. <clears throat> OK, so. And that was oh, any other question. So if you ha have in the app service point of view, so then we'll move into the next module. OK. Now we have been talking about app. Or a API.
mainly app and API that we are talking about inside an app service plan. But every application is going to go and deal with your data. So the back end for your application will be the data. Now tomorrow, if I think of getting my application to the cloud at the same time, I have to think of the back end also. It would be not kind of a proper implementation. My application has moved to the cloud. My my database is still on the on premises. We can still do that by using hybrid. Deployment using cloud and on premise together. We can do that, but that is not the solutions that we will be. Looking at in context of modernizing our applications, taking them to the cloud. So we need to figure out. Something from the Microsoft Azure in order to. Migrate my data to the cloud, migrate data to the Azure. Like we thought of migrating application to Azure, we got it ASP. Similarly, we thought of migrating the data to the cloud, then we will be given set of services. Now we all of us may be familiar with the SQL database, you know, RDBMS. So can I take an RDBMS from on-premise to cloud? Yes, you can anytime. There is also an RDBMS on the cloud. Anytime you can do that, anytime you can. But we are talking about beyond RDBMS. The RDBMS handling there on the cloud would be easy. It would be exactly the same way that we do in on premise. We are going to do it in the cloud, but that would be a service in a form of service in a form database as a service. The rest is everything is same. But AZ204 has included. A different type of. Backend for your applications, we call them as a stories. So primarily your stories. Is designed to store. Non relational data. Now, what are the non relational data? The non relational data could be a files and folder, non relational data in a form of messages. Non relational data could be. In a form of tables and record, but they do not understand anything primary and foreign keys. They do not understand any relational model, but they can store data in a form of table in a rows and columns. So collectively, if I want to go and store this kind of data from my applications, I can select. Microsoft Azure storage solutions, not the database solutions. I'm talking about the storage solutions. So Microsoft Azure storage is a representations of non relational data store on cloud. Non relational data store.
OK. So let's explore it like. What non relational stories that I'm talking about is going to. Offer in context of using them from our applications. So when you explore this Microsoft Azure stories. You get to see. Multiple data service. Files, blobs, tables and queue, but this module is going to talk about only the blob. Stories. This one. Only the blob stories will be explored during this module. Sorry to interrupt. Queues and uh, service bus uh, are they same or? Uh, how they differ when we are talking about uh, storage. Does service bus fall under that group or it's a different service? Yeah, service bus and the storage is a two different. Okay. Service on Microsoft Azure. But OK. The service bus that you are talking about also have. A service called queue. OK, and there so, is another uh, uh, topic. I'm just explaining that. OK. So are we going to cover those event grids and service bus? No, 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 no. See, I say that we cannot cover mm -hmm. in four hours the like whole 12 module, right? That is not possible. Number one. So we are just trying to. Mm -hmm. Make you understand in what context you have to study and prep for your exam, like I explain about the. App service. This is exactly I'm yeah. going to do in the stories and that would be the pattern would be implemented for the rest of the service that you would be learning. So you have to organize yourself to learn things. Then you score more in the exam. It is not just doing practical. We must understand the inner concept of those services. OK, in that context, we are just picking up one or two as long as I can finish by four o'clock. OK, so whatever okay. will be coming on our way, so we'll be explaining that. But the pattern remain the same. It is not possible to do 12 module to cover like what you are talking about. You know, uh, you are saying that even greed, even hub, this is basically from the. Event based solutions. There is a message based solutions and event based solution. Under the event based solutions, you get to see the event greed and the. Event hub. Yeah. And the message based mm -hmm. solutions, you get to see the storage queue and the service bus queue. OK, so these are the service to 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 just to. Implement the concept of. Application architecture, so in what application architecture that you would be deploying application on the cloud, so it may be a message based architecture or it could be a event based architecture. But we need okay. to understand the learning patterns all over. Yeah. Yeah, it's just if possible, can you just give us an overview of uh, different architectures that are available? As you said, message based architecture, event based ar architecture. Similarly, just various architectural patterns that we commonly use in Azure that will be it will be great if you can give an overview. See, That's this will be fact. exam prep for AZ204, okay? 
Okay. This is exam prep for AZ204. So whatever comes on our way in AZ204 in context of architecture, I'll be speaking on that. Right. Uh -huh. So there are approximately 200 architecture that I can speak uh, on the cloud, like architecture from an IoT, architecture from an artificial intelligence, architecture from a data science, architecture from the containerization, architecture from the, you know, uh, uh, event base, architecture from the message base architecture from the app modernizations it's a never ending stories right so since no, just for uh, yeah .net, so, dot net based web applications dot net core web applications no, so dot net core also will be working with all this architecture now because iot development also would be done in dot net so we can only talk about the architecture in the what is being like suppose you ask for a message base or an event base i can quickly explain that what is message base or what is uh, uh what is called uh, your uh, yeah i mean uh, event base the two architecture that we talk about because it is included in az204 in context of dotnet application that is perfectly fine yeah okay. so we'll Thank do that <clears throat> but as you're saying that you know okay. architecture then you have to go and the broad if you go to the Microsoft browsing, there are you will get a lot of architects are there. In fact, you know, so you can see that also I can share that URL. So where you are going to get all the architectural diagrams, what I was talking about just now. See, there uh, is another exam also Azure Solution Architect. Yeah, that is AZ304 so, or uh, 305. In that you will be if you enroll for that. You will be telling mm -hmm. all the architects are including what I was talking about. All the architects. Are. There are 11 module there. Every module talks about different architecture. So at least you will be given 11 architects are there in this course. AZ305. Previously it was AZ304. Now it has become AZ305. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, that uh, session comes in September sometime. I had seen, I think, or is it coming in near future anytime? I do not have any information about tomorrow what session I am going in. So I'll be updating with my calendars every week. I do not know what is there. Maybe I I will be maybe into that because I'm certified with all. I'm certified with IoT certification. I'm certified with the data science. I'm certified with the AZ305, 304, 303, 204, 104, 400. So it's like, you know, it may be 16 to 17 certification I have done so far with the latest one. So I do not know when I'll be going to which uh, so maybe in September, I do not know if my name is there. I'll be I, I'll be the trainer for that. And then I'll be talking about in that context. OK, so now I'll be talking about only the context of AZ204. And if you have a very specific questions, I'm always ready to. Uh, you know, yeah. answer that specific questions. No problem in that. OK, which may be out of the context also. But better think, we need to speak to. Yeah. yeah, I was more interested in a uh, differentiation between those message queues and message uh, service bus kind of. So as you said, it's a service based architecture and in wave based architecture. Oh, I, can I, find about, it. I can talk about that. What is the difference between uh, your uh, message based architecture and, uh, and, and your uh, event based architecture? Of course, I can talk about that. Yes, I will do that. No problem. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right, so. So what I was saying that, you know, now we are talking about the storage point of views because. App is always go and store data. Now we just need to decide what type of data that app is going to deal with. But we are not talking about SQL or traditional kind of stories. There are two stories is being discussed in AZ204. The stories, the blob stories and the Cosmos DB. 
OK, that is the two things they talked about. Uh, in included about about the data point of views, you know, the data storage point of views. So now we are working with the blob storage quickly. We'll go back and see it. So. Storage. As a account means it's called as an umbrella service. What do you mean by umbrella service? We just create a storage account on the cloud, but eventually we get different services under the storage account. Files, blobs, tables and queues. So when do I use blob? When do I use files? When do I use table and when do I use queues? That is only we need to figure out. Now I'll just quickly brief about these three thing, four things, and then we'll stick to only the blob, and we'll talk about more on the blobs. Suppose we are working on a legacy application on premise from last fifteen years, and these applications use a lot of files from the file server network file server. They need to write onto the files. They need to retrieve files. They need to browse files. And the files driven application that we are working in a lot of legacy applications is using files. Let me tell you that that is the architecture of your legacy application. Now today you are thinking of getting them to the cloud saying that OK, fine. Why can't you take my legacy application to the cloud? I should be able to take it. Now, yes, you can take your applications to the cloud anytime, but what about those file system that you are working from your application on premises? Can I get the same environment on the cloud to keep my files and the way that I have been accessing from my applications? Can I get it done? The answer is yes, by opting for the file service under the storage account. That's why it is called as a lift and shift. This is the point that I want to emphasize. When do I go and use file storage? To enhance the productivity of the developer in order to run applications smoothly on the cloud. Lift and shift. That's one. OK. Now when do I use the blob? Now blob is a complete new concept. It's a cloud native concept. It is being innovated in the cloud. The blob is pretty interesting. That's why today the blob is being used extensively for one reason. It is called as a REST based cloud object store. So it means. If I'm storing an image. Or a video as a blob. I can directly get access or I can directly stream them. I can directly browse them from your application by having the URL of that blobs, URL of that image or URL of the videos. It's a direct streaming and direct browsing would be done by making an REST call, HTTP call from the browser itself. There are different type of blobs like block blob or piece block or append blob. You will see that in the MOC. I'll not go into the detail of everything because we will be running out of time to explain all of them. But you can always take the reference going back in there. The third one is a table. Now table is called for like in what context the table would be used. It says by by by. By just going with the table. 
we can say, OK, is it a table that we create in my SQL database? No, it is not a SQL. That's why it is called no SQL. Do not compare the table with the SQL table. It's no SQL. It has nothing to do with SQL. But what is it? It is just a store of entities. Entities means every single record of this table would be called as an entities. Entity is nothing but an object that represent a particular entities like product, like customers, like order, like invoice. The detail of an invoice can be stored inside a table in a form of objects, the rows, collections that we talked about. But it does not support anything the relational implementation, anything from relational in implementation, primary key, foreign keys, you know, one to many, one to one between the tables, nothing like that. It, these are independent tables. And the queues. Now, queue is being used for queue is being used for storing messages. Like we talk about message based architecture. So let's talk about that. So I have a storage queue. Let me let me take an example. A multiple user. I'm just explaining the queue based architecture that you ask. OK, so then at the same time I can explain the queue also. Suppose in a e-commerce application. Multiple customer can place order. You place order. And there is a back end system. who basically process the customer's order. There may be an API. Who basically process that customer order? But let us look at this situation. If 100 people has placed an order at the same time, how this API is going to process 100 order at the same time? It is not possible. If you try pinging APIs, the API will fail to respond to the 100 people at the same time. So what it does, you put something in between. And we call them as a queue. So all this order is being placed by the 100 people will come to this queue one after another. Based on the time when they have placed the order. Then now once those order is order one, order two, order threes and so on and so forth. And this is basically saying that order cannot be processed at real time. It takes some time. You can just send an acknowledgement about the processing and order by looking at the inventories, saying that, okay, how many quantities available, whether I can take an order or not. But processing an order is a real task that cannot be done at real time, I can only acknowledge saying that, OK, your order is being placed. 
because I can do it because I know the inventory quantities, the number of inventory I have. That that can be checked at right real time and send it the acknowledgement back to the user saying that your order is being placed. Nothing more than that. But actual processing and order will take some time. The question is that who's supposed to process the order? Will be taking those order from the queue. One after another. And process it. And complete that transaction of order processing that we are stuck. We, we, we discussed the architecture that we discussed. So it means the queue is being used as an intermediate storage, not as a permanent storage. To accomplish a task. Between the sender and the receiver. So the placing order, these are the sender who send a message and the receiver who's supposed to receive in order to process is the API. But in between, we just put a queue. That my API can come and pick those order in a form of messages. And process it. In the same order that is being. Placed by an individual. So we got two type of queue, as I mentioned before. One is the storage queue, what we are currently talking about, and one is service bus queue. This is my storage queue, what we are discussing at this moment, and service bus queue. So I'll quickly give a difference between the two queue. The service bus queue work on FIFO, first in, first out. The example I'm taking it, it is only can be done by the service bus queue, not by the storage queue, because storage queue does not support first in first out. Storage queue does not follow the orders, but service bus queue follow the orders. And apart from that, service bus queue support more. Like storage queue, a, a mess, size of the message can go up to 64 KB only, but in the Service bus queue messages can go beyond 64 KB. In service bus queue, I can retain a message for seven days only, but in sorry, uh, storage queue, I can retain a message maximum seven days only, but in service bus queue, we can retain a message more than seven, seven days. Service bus queue does not support transactions across the messages, but the storage queue does not support transactions across the messages. Service bus queue support the transit. I can go on and on. The difference between, but I'm talking about the fundamental architecture here. I can go to the functionality of those queues. What is being offered by service bus queue and what is being offered by the storage queue? But if I do not know where to use a queue by putting them in an architecture, it does not make any sense. Rest to anywhere just by reading, you will get to know what is being supported by storage queue and what is being supported by service bus queue and how you can take a call whether I should go with the service bus queue or whether I should go with the storage queue. You will be defined by looking at the use cases problem statement. The problem statement will drive in order to select a queue in this scenario. Right. So, as you said, uh, order processing cannot be real time, so it can wait in queues. Uh, so, and there, uh, message driven architecture we can do, we go for. But what will be the real time example of a event based uh, application? In which scenario we will go for the events? You only ask the question and you are only answering that, you know. So in real time, you will be using event based solutions. Right, so you are uh, only. Yeah. 
so i mean which would be the best example for it as you said order processing will be a messaging system it can wait for a while it won't be real time uh, just for a practical example uh, what would be for, the for event based for event based what will be the real time example in which scenario we will be using it okay you are trying to log into your bank okay account and okay. you are not the person you are not the person somebody else okay. is trying to log into your bank account but that person was doing okay. a permutation combination of the password of yours okay so this is what this is called as a fraud event. Oh, no. Okay. Now, the moment the application identify is a fraud event, what need to be done? You need to lock your account. Okay. For yeah. next 24 hours. Now, there is no other way somebody is trying to steal your account and you come after 24 hours after seven days and then lock your account is it make sense you have to do it no. real time yeah another example your iot internet of thing there is a sensor Okay. Who can sense a car that is passing through a tool board? And police department has sent an alert about a car number into the tool board. The moment car passes to the tool board, police will get the notification. Is there any sense the police will get the notification after 24 hours that car will be by that time will leave that state where the tool boat was crossing? That is an event. I can go on and on. These are practical example. And we have developed solutions yep. for different customers. I have been associating with 148 customers where I have migrated more than 1000 applications like this. OK, so it would be pretty but, interesting uh, getting into the AZ205 yeah. where we can talk about more on this kind of architecture. Yes, somebody was speaking in between. Yeah, no, just, just, uh, I mean, just to make it more confusing, uh, uh, the messages in a queue can also be the event which would trigger something, right? No I know trigger. I'm just... There is no trigger. Okay. There is the no trigger e in the... Yeah. Uh, so, an uh, event can be a message in a queue as well, right? The, when we talk about event, you said that uh, 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 a car is... I can't hear you. I can't hear you. You have to you have to come closer to the mic and speak. Who is speaking? I do not know. What is your name? Uh, I... You have to come closer. Hello? If anybody can hear him. Yogesh, if you are speaking, please uh, check with your mic as we can't hear you. If you are speaking and asking any question, please check. Uh, that's OK. Uh, Still, it is not audible to us. You can you can type messages, you know.
Okay, so whenever your mic is all right, you can always ask question, but we are talking about at this moment the stories from top to bottom. So we talk about the queue in and then we we can go and explore a bit of implementations like stories as well as your applications together. But we'll do that implementations when you come back from the break. So it's a break time now, 1.30. So we'll be taking a break for one hour. We'll be starting at 2.30. So tell if, if, if you have anything to announce in between. Yeah, yeah, sure, sir. I will okay. take it. Okay, okay no problem. Uh, okay, is, is my mic working now? I'm just testing the mic right now. Yeah, yeah, now yeah, I can yeah. hear you. Now I can hear you. Now we can hear you. Yeah, sorry for that thing. So that's, uh, that's no it. problem. Uh, I was just saying that uh, event based systems can also, uh, I mean, the event can be uh, a message coming through a queue as well, right? Uh, uh, for example, when you said that a car passing through a uh, toll gate is triggering something in real time. So that can that was the event which triggered something in the system in the real time. Similarly, a message through a queue. I do not. Oh yeah, so right. I got your point, but I do not yeah. know what you are referring real uh, time that uh, you know, let let us understand yeah. okay, these things. Uh -huh. OK, then you have to understand uh -huh. the difference between the event hub and the storage queue uh, or even greed and the storage queue. Then if you know okay. the difference between the two, then you will your answer will be there itself. Mm -hmm. The uh -huh. two services two different. Otherwise, Microsoft did not introduce the storage and the uh, event greed. So even grid is designed for an event because they can talk to the subscription and subscription in turn call to the event handler at real time automatically. But here you have to do on your own. You have to configure the things the moment the messages come. You have to create a functions by triggering that. But this is this is you are doing it uh, by doing and work around. It is not out of the box. But there yeah. when you talk about the event grid, it is out of the box. They talks about subscription. They talks about event a handler and that all are automated. Yeah. I don't have to do anything yeah. out there, but here you have to do everything on your own. You have to treat that message as an event. You have to put someone keeping keep looking at the message. When the message come that you have to go, you are doing it forcefully, right? The yeah. architecture we need to understand because it is being designed by the architect and subsequently it is being backed by the technology. So we have to differentiate between the technology, the scope where it can be used. The queue and the uh, event grid. That's why we have to, that's where we have to understand the difference between. You can forcefully, you can say, okay, this is the event also. The when the event message will come, I'll treat them as an event. I'll ask somebody to pick up the message pretty quickly and do it the response. Yes, you can. If you're talking about whether I can do or not. Yes, you yeah. can. I, I was just talking about specifically in strictly in terms of technical implementation, yeah. not from the architectural per perspective. Okay, great. Okay, so yeah, fine. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And really, I mean, your explanation was great. I mean, I would, uh, I would, I, I am very new to event grid and things. I, I don't know anything about it, so I will probably okay. read about it. Okay, yeah. all, right. Thank, all right. Thank you. <laughs> just to guide no me in the right direction. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. All right. Oh, all right. Yeah. So we, we, are, we, we, are, uh, yeah. sorry, we, okay, we are. Sorry, we are. We are going to discuss blobs and files later on, right? Yeah. No. We have just one hour left, and we'll be talking about few more concept. Then we'll be done for the day. But you just go to the MOC that is being shared by you, or uh, shared by us. I think the back office has already shared those MOC. Please go to the MOC in case if you have any questions. I think you can. I don't know that. Uh, following things that certainly will explain if you have any doubt or if you have anything how you are going to coordinate with us. I think everything would be uh, explained by uh, the today's meeting coordinator. C yeah. is there in the meeting. OK. Yeah. OK. So I'll be away from this now.
So if yeah, you have sure any sir. questions so far, yeah, thank you. Right. So we, as we are on break, uh, please check with your emails. I, I have shared the MOC code on your email IDs, which you have given the registered email IDs. Also follow the steps and mention in the mail body and get access to the MOC, which we have provided to you. The code has been provided to you. And those who have not received the MOC code for AZ204 and want to claim the free MOC code, do sum submit the MOC activation form, which has been mentioned in the chat box. Again, I am mentioning it. If you want, do claim your response on it so we can share the MOC code for AZ204. Yeah, I have uh, given I the MOC code form. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I joined through the chat. So what yeah. do I need to do exactly to get the you have to fill out the form for MOC? This is the MOC activation okay. form. MOC stands for exactly what I sorry Microsoft I missed a couple of things. Uh, courseware. It is the study material uh, provided to you for AZ204. Is it a online? Uh, yeah, yeah, it will be available for uh, or... you online. No, you it's have a to redeem that code. Okay, I am in this chat called Azure Tech Community. Is this the correct one? I don't see anything here to fill it yeah, out, yeah, fill anything right. out. So I don't see anything to fill here. It just says join I us link just is now there. the MOC activation form. You can see in the chat box. Uh huh. Mm, okay, fine. Hello, Chaitali. So I, I yeah, yeah. Is there any app also we uh, install in mo mobile and then we can read also in in traveling time also and that with that. Is there any app also? Yes, you can access it through the mobile also. It is available on mobile also. You is there any app also? No, no, not the app, but you can go on that link and you can get access. Okay, to okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Okay, I have submitted that MOC activation form. So what are, what will be done next? Yeah, yeah, I got your response. I will be sharing the MOC code on your email ID. Just give me some minute. I will be sharing the code. It's a code, the practice code that we will be getting or that's, uh, we will that's be sharing the be steps get. to redeem the code. Once you redeem the code, you will get access to that study material. Okay, the material when you say it's a uh, tutorial video or it's a PDF and documents. Just like a PDF or there's a booklet you will get to read on uh, the what we call the topics you can get to read and all. Just like sir said now the oh. MOC which includes all we, uh, he is explaining so you can get through that. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. 